Hello, everyone. Welcome to Mondays with Muroc. This is a special edition. We're grateful that you are watching, attending with us today. I have with me Brent Tan, our assistant superintendent. I'm Kevin Cordes, district superintendent. And today we are going to talk about some adjustments that have been made to policies, protocols, procedures, and all of the other words that go with COVID-19 and students being able to attend school and be here safely. And what do we do if, in fact, somebody may test positive for COVID-19 or be exposed to someone that has? We typically do this differently for uh, those that may be joining us for the first time. Um, but today, we're going to be going over so much detail that we actually have notes. And we want to make sure that we don't misspeak what we're saying. So if it looks like we're reading some, we actually are. Um, in, in post-production, we intend to have some things that are going to pop up and cover us up so that you can see some of the, the graphics that we have created for you. They will be placed on our website as well for the district. So if you'd like to see them in the future, you can either come to the video or you can find them there as well. But um, the format for this today is Brent and I are both parents uh, in the school district as well as employees. So Brent is going to take a bit of a parental role and ask some questions that we get daily from parents and hopefully hit questions that would come because of these adjustments and try to get ahead of those questions for you and get you answers ahead of time. So um, one of the big adjustments that has been made is over the, the holiday break, California came out and said that the state would follow the CDC guidelines, which was a fairly large adjustment for the state. And the first iteration through, they said, except for schools, and we're going to keep schools exactly where they're at. And from that point until even today, there's been a near daily adjustment to protocols and procedures and the rules that we'll be following. We feel confident at this point that we have at least a we have a, a, a comfortability with the rules that we've been given. We know that they will change, that other directives will be given to us, but we feel that we finally have an iteration of the latest changes so that we can share them with you and we will begin implementing them next Monday. So with that, um, we are gonna be talking about isolation, quarantine, and just to clarify what those two mean, isolation, is a term that is used for an individual who has tested positive for COVID and being sent home on quarantine or needing to quarantine is for someone who has been a close contact to that individual who needs to be in isolation. So as we use those words, they're not actually, even though we use them interchangeably a lot of times um, in our everyday speak as people, um, there's very specific terms for what those mean. So when we talk about isolation, we will be speaking about people who have tested positive. When we talk about quarantine, we're talking about people who have been exposed to someone who has tested positive. We're gonna discuss the way that we adjust our testing um, on, for students. We're going to talk about close contact tracing approaches, both for um, our younger students in the elementary level and those at the high school. And we're going to be reviewing all these changes in detail to hopefully help you to better understand the complexities of all this new guidance. So with that, Brent, fire away and let's see if I can answer some questions. Absolutely. So as Kevin said, I'm gonna be taking on the role of a parent. So let's start with uh, positive cases. Uh, transitional kindergartner to 12th grade. Um, if my child tests positive for COVID, what are the isolation procedures? Okay. So the first thing is we would, we would notify you as a parent make sure that, that you know that your child is tested positive here at school. We would not do so unless we've had prior permission to test them. And at that point, the student will need to go home and isolate for five days. Um, they can test on day five, and if they either test negative or if symptoms are resolving and there has not, they don't have a fever and they've not needed fever-reducing medications for the previous 24 hours, then they can come back to school on that sixth day, the next day. Sometimes there is a little confusion if the fifth day is on a weekend. So you may have to come back and it winds up, it turns into a sixth day or a seventh day, but it's just because your fifth day landed on a day when we don't have school. 
So we just extend that to the next Monday. Awesome. So with the scarcity of COVID tests in the community, the unavailability it is to really get it at CVS and even to go in and make an appointment and how long it takes to get your results back, I really want to get my child tested and results as soon as possible mm -hmm. so they can come back to school. How can I do that? Perfect question. So one of the benefits that education has seen from both state and federal government is support for students to receive um, rapid antigen tests um, at the school site. So we have enough tests here uh, in the school district to cover students and staff. Not necessarily enough to cover mom and dad um, or siblings that aren't school age, but we can. We definitely have that ability. So we have been piloting a, a clinic out of West Boron, in, at West Boron Elementary in Boron, and that operates every day, Monday through Friday, from 1 to 1.30. And we are now going to open one up at Branch Elementary from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Monday through Friday. So if your child needs to be tested, they've been isolating or maybe they've been, um, so they're isolating at home and you need that test, you can come to the school, um, to Branch, and you'll be able to get that test and see about coming back. Awesome, awesome. So kind of going back to that first question I asked, my child's in isolation. Okay. We're at day five. Mm -hmm. We show up to the clinic. Um, we have our child tested and he tests positive. What then? All right, so at that point, he's gotta go back home with you and we go home for another five days. At the conclusion of that 10 day, now 10 day period, as long as those symptoms are improving, mm -hmm. and again, no fever, no need for fever reducing medication for the previous 24 hours, you just get to come back to school. Mm -hmm. You can come back. Perfect. So I'm going to switch gears and um, I want to talk about, um, let's talk about transitional kindergarten to sixth grade. Okay. And specifically um, in school exposure or close contact as we know it. So if my child um, is exposed to an individual with COVID-19, um, what happens? In the transitional through sixth grade, what we have been, I want to talk about what we've been doing and then what we're going to do. Um, we have been given some flexibility. Um, in these guideline adjustments. And we can go a couple of different ways. And what we, what we are going to do is we're gonna go to a group tracing approach. We all know that little children, um, at, especially the younger they are, the more mobile they are. And especially right now, um, the transmissibility rate um, with Omicron is so high that for students at the elementary grade level, in the past, what we have done is we have tested their table group, the, the people they're around. It's, it's usually a small cohort, four to six individuals, and that is the group that we look at to see if they had an exposure. But we recognize with Omicron that, um, again, that transmissibility rate is so high, and the fact that we do have to help them to keep their masks up. They interchange with groups as much as we try to keep them with their group, we need them to be with their peers. And they're, they're in reading groups and in math groups, so they're on the floor sometimes together, especially if they're young and they're doing calendar and all sorts of things. So their exposure to one another is, is so much that we're gonna go to what we call group tracing. And we'll be able to go into a classroom and if we have a positive case in a classroom, we'll test all of the students that we have permission to test in that environment, right there in that room and be able to do it. It will be confidential. We're not gonna shout out the results or anything like that, but we'll be able to do it quickly, confidentially, and be able to see that whole class. What we have noticed is, uh, as here's a scenario. On a, on a Monday, we'll have a student that tests positive and say it's in my classroom. I have a student that tests positive. I test that little cohort group and we, we move forward with that. We isolate and we quarantine accordingly. And then on Wednesday, someone else in the class mm -hmm. tests positive. Well, they probably would have tested positive on Monday had we just known. So this will also allow us hopefully to recognize and be able to, to see more of the positive cases when they actually are positive in school which will allow students to be at home, to rest and to get better and to keep it from hopefully spreading any further at the school sites. Awesome, good to hear. Um, so in regards to my child, if they are to be exposed in school, how as a parent will I be notified? We have now reached a point, a, a, a tipping point that is just unattainable. We are, we're, 
we have committed from the beginning, um, especially with you families, um, that we would make personalized phone calls every single time. And at this point, our nursing staff has almost turned into a half of their time or greater has turned into a call center. And the purpose for them is to oversee the health and welfare safety of children. And because oftentimes they're the people that would have the answers, we like for them to be on the phone with a parent, but we do not have the staffing to be able to accomplish all of that. So on Monday, um, or today, I should say, as this video is, is coming out, your child should be bringing home a new fresh permission slip related to being able to test your student, not with a PCR. That's the type that goes all the way up into your back of your brain. It's very uncomfortable. We do not do PCR tests. We don't have laboratories. We don't have contracts with laboratories to do that. We, we have rapid antigen tests. The, it goes just a little bit in the nose, and we're looking for the, the, t the well, it's the snot. We're all parents. So we're looking for snot up in the nose, and then we test off of that to see um, if, if they're positive or not. So what we're going to do is send home a permission slip, and on that slip, we are going to ask for some very specific and very needed information. We need to update and ensure that we have the most accurate phone numbers that we can text to, uh, emergency numbers. Um, email addresses as well, and, and please, please fill that out for us. We will update our system, and we are going to begin using an automated messenger system to notify you if your child has had an exposure at school, and um, we just have to pivot to that because we are finding that to make these phone calls and to get the information to the parents so that they're at least aware we are unable to always do that in a timely fashion like we always like we were able to in the beginning when there weren't as many cases. Mm -hmm. um, as of today, we're filming this on Friday, by the way, and the wind is blowing terribly outside. But as we, as we sit today, we have one of our elementary schools, uh, Westbourne Elementary, 110 out of the 320 students were out today. So that's the amount of phone calls at one school site. And oftentimes as parents, we, we have the same questions. Mm -hmm. I, and we want to be able to answer those. Um, and that's why we're hoping this will help to answer a lot of those questions and the notification will come so that you as a parent can know immediately if there has been a, 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 a case in your child's classroom and you'll be notified of exactly what has happened. It won't be a generic, something's happened at your school. You're gonna get some information related to um, whether they've tested positive or they've been a close contact. And um, it, it will be, it will work. It really will. And so we, we just need those slips to be filled out, please, and to be sent back. Now, in the event that you say a parent doesn't want their child to be tested, we completely and a thousand percent respect that but we also have to live within the rules that we've been given in these guidelines. And if we can't test someone, then they must isolate for 10 days. Actually, I just said that wrong. They must quarantine for 10 days if they've been a close contact or isolate if they, if they show symptoms. Mm -hmm. So um, just know that we will never test your child without your permission. And that's why those permission slips are going to become vital. It will only be for this school year too. We're not asking anyone to sign a slip that says in perpetuity we'll be able to do a, a rapid antigen test. It does not have permissions for anything else either. So no, uh, not a PCR test. No, or, um, and we don't do other tests. So you know, but but we don't do blood work. Um, you're not forfeiting your rights to anything else. It just gives us a quicker way to be able to go in and determine in a timely manner exactly who may be positive and who has been exposed. So just so that I understand, and I'm making sure I understand. So come Monday, um, our students or students will be uh, coming home with a permission slip, um, basically asking permission to um, be able to test or mm -hmm. for us to be able to test students for the remainder of the 2021 and 22 school year. Will I be notified still individually by phone or is this basically me giving permission for the entire year? This is giving permission for the entire year. Perfect. 
That's exactly what this is doing. Now, just to clarify on that point a little bit, especially for families, as much as we have tried to personalize this for everyone, um, we have just reached our point where we're unable to do that for you. Um, we have held this line longer than anyone else that I'm aware of. And I would like to give a thanks to our nursing staff and our front office staffs who have made calls to our principals. Some of you have talked with maybe Brent or myself even. Um, we try to spend a, a lot of time um, putting our time and resources into the best places possible. And early on, communication and personalized communication was key, we felt. It's the personalized touch that I would have wanted as a father. Just don't, we just don't have the ability to keep up with the mm -hmm. case numbers that are there. Mm -hmm. So what we're, what we're asking is for the ability to be able to get quick results mm -hmm. so that when we do notify you, we have accurate information. Perfect. So I'm gonna switch gears on you a okay. little bit again. Um, let's switch gears to uh, grades seven through 12th. Okay. So our junior, senior high school. Um, let's talk, continue to talk about in-school exposure, so close contact okay. in the school setting. So, um, I'm in high school, okay. Um, or my child's in high school. Uh, he or she's fully vaccinated, and they are exposed to COVID in the school setting. What happens? So, let's go to the chart. <laughs> <laughs> so, one thing: quarantine is not required in that in that case. Students without symptoms may remain in school and participate in all school activities. Perfect. Perfect. So let's say, let, let's talk about uh, another scenario where let's say at this point in time, my child is not vaccinated and um, both parties were determined um, to be wearing masks. What happens then? Then we can offer what's called modified quarantine. Modified quarantine allows for five days of in-school quarantine, which can be confusing because a lot of times you think quarantine, you're thinking at home. But we do have a way, when we talk modified quarantine, Modified means in school. So we're able to do five days of in-school quarantine. We would need to test twice within that five-day quarantine time period. The student would need to stay asymptomatic and they will just need to not be able to participate in sports, unfortunately, for those five days. Mm -hmm. um, now, for those that play sports, you know that in the past with our previous um, guidance that we had, the modified quarantine would keep you out until that, that you test on day seven, get to come back mm -hmm. to sports on day eight. Now you only have to go five days. Mm -hmm. So we, we get kids back out into, onto the basketball courts mm -hmm. um, or the football field or the mm -hmm. baseball field um, three days sooner. So great news for high school students who need to go onto a modified quarantine. Perfect, perfect. So third scenario here. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> So my child is unvaccinated at this point in time, and let's say both parties were not wearing their mask or even one person was not wearing their mask. What happens? Okay. And that does happen. As much as we emphasize mask wearing and, and remind students when we see that they have slipped where they're not supposed to be, if it's determined that that is the case, then um, they need to be out of school and quarantined for five days. They would test on day five and need to produce a negative test, stay asymptomatic, and then they could come back to school. Perfect. And we may have uh, touched on this, but let's say, um, you know, for whatever reason, I'm unable to, or, you know, I just don't feel comfortable having my child test. What happens? We absolutely respect that. The guidelines do not give us any more flexibility than, than to send them home for 10 days. Okay. So you, you absolutely can. And then we can, and we can offer the short-term independent study in those cases, just like with any other quarantine period. We just are unable to do anything smaller than 10 days. That is, that is the law. Was, um, we'll respect everyone's wishes. We hold no judgment towards people when it comes to that. And we completely understand. We'll not even ask you for a reason. We're not going to hound you over right. it. But if we don't have that permission to do so, um, we're just going to have to quarantine them at home for 10 days. For the parent that may think, um, well, maybe I would be comfortable sometimes and there could be reasons I wouldn't others. Mm -hmm. Couldn't I please get a phone call? I've got to tell you, I love you, but I just, I can't. I won't be able to keep up with that. So if you say no, um, you would not, you don't want us to test and your child gets sent home for 10 days. We won't be able to negotiate at that moment. 
and, and receive a verbal in lieu of being sent home for 10 days. It's just done. But if after that you want to change your mind and let us know, we'll be able to, to do it at that point. Otherwise, we're just opening it back up again to making phone calls to everybody each time. All right, switching gears with uh, a little bit, Kevin, again. Um, so let's talk about um, out-of-school exposure for, uh, let's go transitional kindergarten to 12th grade. Okay. Um, what happens if my child is exposed to COVID-19 outside of the school um, and is vaccinated? All right, that's the easiest scenario possible. So I'm glad you're softballing me. So quarantine's not required. A student, as long as they are not showing any symptoms, um, they can return right back to school. They can participate in after school activities and everything's fine. Perfect. So what if my child is exposed to COVID outside of school in the community and is currently unvaccinated? So unvaccinated, they would need to stay out of school and quarantine for five days. They test on day five and need to produce a negative test. Okay. Um, and they need to stay asymptomatic and they can come back to school. Okay. So. Um, I know you touched earlier on um, something called modified quarantine, if I'm correct, where if, if they, both parties were wearing a mask, then basically you could offer them something where they wouldn't have to skip school. Um, so what if, you know, the exposure happened outside of school, but I can assure you or, you know, that we were both wearing masks. So could I get modified quarantine? I wish we could. <laughs> we would love to trust you and actually probably would. Um, we, we tend to trust you all the time, but the guidelines do not allow for that. So the way the guidelines are written is that that exposure, whatever, whatever the exposure is, it must be in a supervised school setting to be considered an in-school. Gotcha. So for us to be able to consider it in that way. And we just cannot do so. You're not in a school setting when you're at your home or when you're out shopping. And so that's just not possible, I'm afraid. So I just want to be certain I'm, I, I'm understanding correctly. So let's say I'm unwilling or unable to test my child. Is it the 10 day quarantine still? Yes, if you're talking about not, not giving permission to test, which we totally would respect um, a thousand percent. Um, but what would happen is it's an automatic 10 day quarantine at that point. So uh, we do have the clinics okay. um, that people could come in and see if they would like to get a test. But um, yeah, if, if, if you, we don't have permission to test, we have to quarantine for 10 days. Gotcha, gotcha. So I know there's um, a lot of confusion in regards to actually in the home exposures. And um, from what we've been hearing is actually the quarantine time can be a lot longer than mm -hmm. 10 days. Can you kind of go into some details, maybe a vignette, and kind of explain that? Yeah, so the California Department of Health guidelines for students, um, the way that they address quarantine time for an at-home exposure, let's use some examples. Let's say that I tested positive at home. I am now going to need to isolate for at least five days. And in this case, let's say I'm really healthy and I, I, I pull through mm -hmm. and on day five I test negative and I'm, I'm healthy and everything's great. Okay. My student needs to still, um, I've isolated, they need to quarantine. Their quarantine time has to wait until my isolation time ends. Then they can begin to quarantine. Although they are quarantining while I'm isolating, we just don't get to count those days. Mm -hmm. So they're at home with me and they're waiting for me to get healthy. And once I'm healthy, now their quarantine time can begin because we're at home together. And um, in this particular case, because we all live together and um, they would go to day five. We could test at day five, and if they're good to come to school, then we're great. If they test positive, then we, we of course, follow suit after that. Perfect, perfect. Now, there's a lot of other scenarios, though, so let's talk a little bit about what in-school exposure and out-of-school exposure is. Um, we only have students for a few hours, really, out of the day. Um, when you look at a 24-hour day, and you take in account weekends and holidays and everything else. Um, if there is a positive case in school and the student in question who, who's been exposed is there with them in the controlled school setting. Mm -hmm. um, that is called in-school exposure. Anything else really is outside of school exposure. That's an at-home exposure. So we have people that use childcare at Edwards Air Force Base. 
Um, let's say that there is a student that tests positive there um, and your child is exposed there at that center. Because it's not in a supervised school setting, even if the provider were to tell us, no, we always have the masks mm -hmm. on, we, we do everything, the guidelines do not allow us to do that. Again, they're not an extension of school. Gotcha. So if the exposure happened at any time, any place outside of the school setting, it's an out of school exposure and we'd have to follow those rules accordingly. If it's in school, if it's during the school day while we're observing the students, mm -hmm. then we can call it in school. So there are some different scenarios that would come into play. Mm -hmm. Let's think, um, again, we'll go back to childcare. Let's say that you leave the school and you go over to uh, your childcare provider and someone at that facility has now tested positive and your student has come into close contact over there. That's still considered an out of school exposure. Gotcha, okay. because the school staff was not there to be able to witness and right. was it in in school skating. I exactly. got you. Okay, so I just have a couple other questions to ask you. Um, honestly, it sounds like a lot of these new requirements that California Department of Public Health are kind of implementing for the school setting is going to require a lot more testing. So what has Muroc done to kind of really meet some of those challenges? We are very, very blessed um, as a school district to have Edwards Air Force Base as a part of it. Um, we get an influx of people that otherwise in this remote location we otherwise would not see. So surrounding school districts, as I meet with superintendents um, in Kern County, there are no other districts anywhere near us that are able to talk about the health care providers that we have similar to us so we have three registered nurses on staff we have an an lvn that works for the district now we have health aides at all of our schools um, and so with all of these individuals we are able to go and test students keep it confidential do it in a timely manner and know that we've done it correctly. And it's really nice also, as you know, for people like you and me to mm -hmm. go to them and ask questions because Absolutely. we work with them. Um, for parents to know, there are times when you have given permission for tests that Brent has done it or I have done it. And that is under, after we have received our training and under the direction of our registered nurses. Other districts really don't have this. Many, many, many just send the students directly home. And we have employees that um, have had to stay home for multiple weeks, in fact, because the schools, their school districts where their students attend, where they live, you know, a lot of people, they commute into us. Um, they just don't have the ability to be able to, to help in this way. So I am, I'm, I'm, I'm really proud and I'm happy with what we're able to provide, but I'm really pleased and proud of, of our medical staff and all that they do. They're the ones that are making this happen. Awesome. Um, so going back to the clinic again, mm -hmm. um, could you kind of give us details again regarding the clinic, the locations, the hours, the yeah. days, who's eligible, things like that? Absolutely. So the clinics are eligible for, for school age students that attend our schools. That's who those tests are for. The clinics at Branch Elementary School are gonna be located at the front office. If you just go up to the front office of the school, it will be very evident where that clinic is going to be. You'll see the signs and, and, and the seating and we'll have people spaced out uh, accordingly and we, uh, we'll, we'll have that taken care of right there at Branch Elementary School. At West Boron Elementary School, it's in the multi-purpose room. Again, like you're walking right up to the office, you'll see the, you'll see the doors open or the signs up and, and where the people are. And that's gonna run every day from 1 to 1.30 throughout the school day. So branches is 11 a.m. to 1 p.m., Monday through Friday. West Boron, 1 p.m. to 1.30 p.m., Monday through Friday. Just so I'm clear, um, so with the changes in the district, it sounds like there's going to be a couple things happening. Um, one is permission slips, permission slips going yeah. home Monday. Mm -hmm. um, I, my assumption or what I got is that they are going to be asking permission to test 
individuals throughout the entirety of the 2021-22 school year. Mm -hmm. Correct. Um, and in regards to information you're going to be asking in these permission slips forms, um, will you be asking vaccination status? Vaccination status is something that we've added. Um, you know, vaccination status and booster status has become very important as well, because if you are booster eligible mm -hmm. and you have not received your booster, you're considered unvaccinated until you get the booster. So knowing what those dates are, are going to be important for us. Now we track vaccination dates already, right? Parents, parents already give us all that kind of information on when did they receive uh, all those baby vaccinations that we get as an infant and, and toddlers. So this just gets added to, to that roster. So nothing really new for us, except we need to add this to that. We need to know about if you were vaccinated, when you were vaccinated, and that will also allow us to know when you become booster eligible mm -hmm. so that we, you know, we will, I would love to say that we'll be able to be on the ball enough to maybe even help a parent out and let them know, hey, you're at five months out mm -hmm. next month. You're either going to need to get the booster or you're going to slip off. Now, we have given some, some flexibility as well. It's not that if you're booster eligible, you know, at six months, it isn't at six months and one day we say, well, you're, you know, you're, you're unvaccinated, we're gonna continue unvaccinated. We give a little grace period there, I'll give you a week or so to, to get in there. Um, we understand that it can be difficult to get mm -hmm. the booster maybe, but we do need to get that. So we do need to know that. Perfect, perfect. And the other thing I heard is that in regards to documentation, um, kind of the change in policies is that if my child were to be exposed, I should be expecting um, a notification letter regarding um, the exposure, yes. potentially um, the dates or the time frame um, my child um, will be tested if, you know, if the consent or the permission slip was That's signed. Right. That's right. Um, okay. So let's say you've given us permission and we've had an at school exposure. Um, we've We've gone in, we've tested everyone, and your child is fine. They're totally healthy. They'll still come home with, with that document. And it will let you know, hey, there was, today there was an answer. First of all, you'll get, a, you'll get some kind of a text notification or, mm -hmm. or an email. We'll reach out to you. We'd prefer to do it by text, um, just to let you know that there was a, a, an at-school exposure. You don't need to come necessarily get your child, and your child will be coming home with information that form that they'll bring home that afternoon will give you the answers to the questions you're then going to have, such as, do I need to test them? I can't remember what they said in the video now. Mm -hmm. What am I supposed to do? So instead of needing to pick up the phone and ask that, just hold tight. Your student will come home, they'll have that form, and it will be very specific to their, to their situation. So you'll have all that information for you and you'll see exactly what's, what's happening. You know, for me, um... This is a lot of information to digest. Yes. Um, so if I wanted to refer to the, uh, you know, um, if, where could I get this information? It, on our district website, if, you go, if any parent were to go straight to our district website, um, you'll be able to find a COVID tab. You'll also see our latest videos go up on there. So you can go back and see this. Um, we'll, uh, most likely we'll timestamp this video as well as best we can so that maybe you can just grab the segment that means the most to you particularly. You'll be able to come to this video. You'll also be able to go to the website and see a series of flowcharts that will address each of these different scenarios for you. And you'll be able to go back and see it visually. We're giving it to you auditorily. We're educators. We understand that people learn tactilely. Tactilely, now that I'm an educator, I don't know how to say the word, but we learn by, by, by actually doing things. Uh, we learn by sight. We learn by hearing. We're giving it to you in an auditory form right now and perhaps some visuals in this video, but you'll also be able to go back and see these forms and, and be able to read it and have it in your hand, um, print it out potentially, right, and, and have it, but you'll have access to it. Perfect. Well, that's all the questions I have for you. Perfect. I appreciate your time. And, uh, and yours as well. Did we pull this off? Did it look like we pretended that we were a news crew? <laughs> Do you think we made it? I don't know. Um, now, for this, and I want to talk for just a moment for those that are at Edwards Air Force Base specifically. So if you're uh, a Boron parent, um, this may not apply to you. It may if you have a child that's over here. So if you have a child attending schools on base, I want to talk about uh, uh, something real quick. So... Um, 
for the rest of you. If you want to stop watching now, I'll say goodbye now, I guess. Bye. Love you. Um, but if you want to hang on to the end, I'll say goodbye again. Um, we have been working very closely um, with the individuals that um, work with the youth programs on base, especially with child care, to align our policies. We have understood from the beginning that everybody started off with different policies and procedures. And there was a great breadth of policies being implemented by employers, by government agencies, whether it was state or federal, and they did not line up. And as we have progressed through this, through COVID, we have seen more and more alignment. Um, gratefully and thankfully, although we are unable to modify or flex from the guidelines that we are given, um, Edwards Air Force Base, um, even with their regulations, they're able to. And so we are going to align more as closely as we can the time that you need to isolate or, or need to quarantine, both at school and in those programs. Not every scenario is going to line up perfectly, but it will line up much closer than it ever has before. So the goal would absolutely be that if you're able to go to school, that you're able to have childcare. Or that if you're able to obtain your childcare, that during the day your child could be at school. Most of those cases, it, it should work. Um, some of our guidelines are going to preclude a few scenarios perhaps, but it's much more aligned than ever before. So a big shout out and a thanks to Colonel Harris, to um, Anthony um, you know, Coward, who works, who's the chief over, flight chief over, over that Trevor, yeah. Um, those programs and um, the FAB board and everybody, they've just done a tremendous job of, of doing what they can on their end to help families out. And we wanna publicly recognize their efforts in that. So thank you for that. Thank you, Brent, for being here with me this week. Um, thank you. We have Brent's daughter, Everly. She's in the background. She's been very patient. <laughs> We're doing this again. It's Friday evening. And at the end of, a, although a shortened school week, it's still, it feels like a, the end of a long week. So thank you for everyone's time and, and watching this. Um, and we hope that we don't have to make too many more adjustments soon, but that we're, the next ad major adjustments we make may look a little more, uh, have more semblance to what we had two years ago, maybe. So with that, we'll say goodbye and we'll see you next week. Thank you. <laughs>